dry bones and fossil trackways. We're going to be looking at a video called Ge Geology Research from a Biblical Perspective. It actually has both titles. And um, there's a blurb that goes with it, which I will just read. This documentary examines the geological and fossil record through the eyes of creationist scientists. Dr. Leonard Brand of Loma Linda University and Dr. Arthur Chadwick of Southwestern Adventist University. Brand and Chadwick started examining the geologic record more than 40 years ago, and over the decades they've covered thousands of miles and spent immeasurable hours in geologic research. Seeking to understand their observations through the lenses of both the scientific method and the Bible. For those of us who subscribe to a biblical worldview, tremendous upheavals and torrential waters have formed the earth in mere thousands of years of breakneck geological changes. For others, the earth's history moves with a speed more akin to that of a turtle, slow and steady. While there have been moments of uproar, for the most part rivers, streams, desert winds, and ocean waves have made their gradual mark over hundreds of millions of years. How can the evidence be interpreted in two such dramatically different ways? Do these mountains tell the story of thousands of years or 500 million? Most scientists insist that the longer time scale is the only one that fits the fact, the facts, but many Bible-believing scientists disagree. Understandably, understanding how they justify their beliefs, however, takes a closer look at the evidence. Now, um, for those who will be watching this on uh, video later on, I will tell you I do not have permission to actually embed the video. Um, I can show it to the class, but um, if you're going to look at it uh, in, the, uh, in the video, you're going to have to stop and go to the website that's listed, which is probably going to be at the bottom of the video as well. And th so there will be a link there. Um, um, and I have some questions um, when we get done. Uh, number one, is it true? Is the video portraying reality and doing so fairly? Number two, is it persuasive? Do you find that this uh, speaks to you? And do you see whether this would speak to somebody who was uncommitted to begin with? Uh, number three, could it be made better? And if so, how? And so I want you to be thinking of those things while you're watching the video. And uh, the background to the slide is actually taken from the... Uh, the video itself um, when you look it up online and now we're going to play the video. Now my take is a little longer on this than uh, some. Uh, I actually liked the video very much. Uh, the one, the one thing that bothered me a little bit was early on when uh, uh, Leonard Brand had asserted, maybe without giving proof, although there's, I think there's proof there, that uh, the tracks didn't look like dry sand tracks. Um, and he actually published two articles, one of them in 1979 in uh, Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, Paleoecology, um, which is actually a peer-reviewed uh, paper. Before that, um, just a year before that, he had published some of his material in Origins, and I'm giving you both references. They're in the email for those of you who get it. Um, and they have some pictures that almost speak for themselves, and I would have liked to have 
had them take an extra one or two minute uh, detour to show some of this. These are tracks of various creatures. Um, the A, B, and D are the same creature, uh, different places. Uh, C is a different one uh, creature, and you'll notice that the tail that drags is kind of wiggly on this and more straight on that. Um, but you can see a couple of characteristics. One of them is if you're in dry sand, it's harder to keep your tail up. Um, but another one is you'll notice that these are all kind of vague. No toe marks, piles of sand at the back. That's what dry sand looks like at 25 degrees, which is the orientation of the Coconino sandstone. Um, here, here's another one, again, uh, from the same creature that made A, B, and D. This is in dry sand that has had kind of a, a simulation of rain put on it. So it's, it's crusted. Now, you see a little more detail, but the other thing you see is this, the sand breakup. Um, also, it's interesting that the tails don't drag as much, even though probably, uh, probably that's because the sand is harder and harder to make impressions on. Um, uh, that might be sand after a short rainstorm. Um, uh, here's another couple of them that are done on wet sand, the kind of thing that might be done at the seashore, perhaps a little above uh, the water line, um, or perhaps after a huge downpour um, in a dry sand environment. And you can see, yeah, you get a little bit better preservation, but not a whole lot. And then here's uphill in submerged sand, where you can see that you start getting fairly distinct claw marks on these things. And um, again, surprisingly, the tail will sometimes drag. Uh, here's some more uphill. Now, this, this is uphill in underwater sand. Um, now, one of the odd things about and, and this is, again, I, they could have taken one more minute and thrown this in, I think. But uh, uh, they didn't talk about it at all, so I'm not sure that it's worth it. You guys can decide. Uh, but you'll notice that downhill marks are present, whether they be in dry sand, sprinkled sand, wet sand, um, or underwater. Um, and here's, uh, here's downhill in wet sand, here's downhill in underwater sand. And one of the th things that's that really odd is, except for B and C, which is a close-up of B, which we'll see in a minute, the coconut sandstone's uh, footprints are all going uphill. So how did the creatures get down to the bottom in that case? Did they just not want to be there? Um, and uh, that that kind of raises the question of whether maybe they were there and they were getting washed down instead of crawling down and then having to crawl back up. Um, but here you can see fairly well-defined uh, toe marks. Um, this one is going sideways. It's not quite as clear the ones in the uh, video and some of the other ones in uh, the, the uh, photographs that you can find are a little bit more obvious. Um, here is some more actual Coconino marks. Um, I would have to say, I'm, I would say this is not likely to be dry sand, but uh, here's C, which is a close-up of B. This is going sideways. Um, interesting where when it's going sideways, the, the paw marks are still going uphill. They just start being moved to the side. Um, and uh, here's some more. And just so that I wasn't being biased, um, I went and looked at um, 
a couple of other, uh, there's, you can actually get coconino sandstone footprints all over the place. Here's some of the more remarkable ones. And here you can see, again, toe marks are fairly good and where they're absent from dry sand completely. Um, and here's some really good toe marks, almost as if the animal is trying against a current and being and clawing its way up the sand. Um, these ones are originally from the National Park Service, found them in the Pennsylvania State University website. And here's one from Wikipedia, and again, you can see the uh, fairly good uh, toe marks, which is not consistent with dry sand at all. So this is one place where I think if he'd have spent a minute or two showing sand photographs, uh, he could have made, uh, they could have made the video a little uh, more pointed in that one regard. But otherwise, I like the movie. And it didn't take long to make, which apparently they did this all in about two days. Well, of course, the research took a lot longer than that. But the movie itself uh, was put together relatively rapidly. And in my opinion, we need more of this. Um, uh, and for those of you who are wondering why I'm picking on that one little point, it is because uh, I read, uh, it's a Grand Canyon monument to a long age or something like that. What is the, 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 the name of it? And uh, a monument to long ages, I think. But it's a, it's a reply to Grand Canyon Monument of Catastrophe put out by people, yeah, people in, the, um, in, in the creation community, mostly ICR, but they have a few other people there too. Um, and uh, one of the things I noticed in the second book was that they kept making assertions, including about the Coconino sandstones. And they show you these photographs from a ways away, and they show you photographs from a ways away of some other stuff, and they say, see, it was dry sand. Whereas if you get down to the details, no, nah, no, not really. Um, and I just like it when, we, when our reply is substantially better than, than uh, their replies. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, Ariel. Uh, just to add to the uh, to the picture of these uh, tracks going uphill, uh, uh, hardly any of them I ever found going downhill. They're almost always going uphill. Yeah, if you read uh, mm. the two papers that I presented, uh, that that point is made considerably. Yeah. Now, on the south rim, many years ago, there used to be a sign there about these tracks, uh, cooking, you know, and, and, you know, describing. And they raised the question, why would all these tracks be going uphill? And their explanation was that uh, the animals rolled when they went downhill and didn't leave tracks. Uh, there is no animal that we know of that behaves that way. Except armadillos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are not armadillo tracks. <laughs> uh, the uh, and so uh, they finally took the sand down. Uh, it's no longer there. You mean rather than discussing how that one theory didn't work, they just made the subject disappear? Well, the, the, the no, they, they didn't the, modify the sign or put no, a sign that no, said it, uh, the tracks are all going uphill and we don't know why. They just they took it away, you know. It, uh, Interesting. That's one way of making a controversy disappear. It, 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 it completely uh, anomalous behavior you never heard of. To uh, it's an interesting suggestion. But uh, I've never seen an animal do that. But, uh, Comments about the film? Uh, we have a couple of them here.
I think there's a couple of changes I would have made or would have liked to have seen. Um, number one, it was talking about the water ripples, you know, looking like sand ripples, but it showed absolutely no examples whatsoever of ripples underwater caused by water. It showed the fossilized ripples, it showed the sand ripples, but there were no ripples that it showed underwater. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, you can see that. You can go out to the beach or you can go underwater and see them, but they didn't have any samples whatsoever in, in the film, which would have been good. Okay, um, and that would have taken two seconds or one second of video time, I think. Uh, preparation, but, uh, yeah, no, okay. Well, that, well, to find them, yeah, but it should have been in the film because I'm just taking your word for it. Right. You haven't given me any no, proof whatsoever. No, that's a good point. That's uh, a good the point. The other thing that I thought was that the... Um, Footprints, you know, the video with the lizard going up the little thing was really fast, and it wasn't real definitive. I would have liked to have seen that a little, little more definitive to see him really noticeably drifting. I would have liked to have worked, yeah, on that tank thing. It just kind of went zip, and it didn't really show him drifting. I didn't think. You couldn't tell. Yeah, you really couldn't tell what was going on there. Yeah. And uh, so I would have changed. I don't that. know whether they've been able to model that. Is one of the things, and. Uh, uh, I thought one of the interesting things was that uh, they had, the, the sand is at 25 degrees. So in order to make the flume really work, one would have to have water flowing down while the animal's trying to crawl up. Yeah, well, I, I understand that. It would be nice to show that so you could really see it rather than just, again, taking uh -huh. your word for it and just a couple little quick videos. And, uh, and then the last comment was that even the photos that you showed were real grainy black and white. I would have probably backed out a little bit and got some sharper and clearer pictures. Those are the three comments I had on it. Yeah, well, uh, I'm working with the material I got, so I'm Yeah, well, I understand paper, that. You got it out of a textbook or something, but <laughs> those, those pictures could have been more definitive. Yeah. Anyway, that's my comments. You wanted them, you got them. Okay. Uh, you know, one other thing to be interesting to do as further experiments would be to put the 25 grades uh, degree and then have the animal crawl up and then try to put more sand over it and see whether you can actually create a surface that the animal can lay on or, or that you know you can split up and find split open and find the tracks on they should have some fossilized tracks of the lizards rolling down there if they actually did yeah <laughs> that's true but i don't think they found them yet which is why the uh, comment disappeared. I think this one behind it. Uh. Just west of Denver in the hills, there's a good slab of good tracks going up of larger creatures. And then just around the corner, you find the tracks that are a foot deep in what must have been soft mud at the time filled in, of course, now hanging down rather than being a top view. It's the view of the track from the bottom. And it must have been a very sizable animal to make such a track. Yeah. There are those. Um, I think that this is restricted right now to the Coquinina Sandstone. It would be interesting to have um, some graduate student who wants to make a name for him or herself um, start working on the same kinds of things for, uh, uh, for the tracks of other creatures. And uh, like I say, I, I would like to see somebody actually start you know, putting down something, laying tracks in, putting down other stuff, and, and seeing if we can tell not just how it was made, but also how it was buried in order to preserve the, uh, the track intact, which obviously mm -hmm. has been done, um, but we've, we haven't really gotten a modern equivalent of it. I, th I think that's a fairly normal process that develops. That's why we have so many layers, and what forms layers is that uh, you deposit these major particles first, and the sediments tend to get finer as uh, the flow slows down and eventually you may get some very fine sediment and that, that very fine sediment is what separates the next sediment layer above it that has again coarse material to find mm -hmm. and uh, permits uh, separation at that point. 
Uh, it's, this happens all the time when you have cyclic deposition. Oh, like I say, it would be interesting to actually have that happen without messing up the tracks. Uh, one, of the th the, one of the reasons I bring this up is because if you go on the internet and you search on, uh, um, on the images where Leonard Brand has shown, you know, those, those images are all over the place, by the way, uh, or at least in a lot of places. Um, I ran into one person who was commenting and said, see, you put your feet down and uh, here's what you get. And then the, water co the wave comes over and it washes it all away and uh, the, the tracks are gone. So it couldn't have been done underwater. <clears throat> well, the question I have is, well, could it have been done in, under air in that case? Um, <clears throat> You know, and uh, so I think there's more to the story than just the laying down of the tracks. There's, there's the covering up of the tracks without messing them up too badly. And then there's the hardening of it and allowing it to crack in the middle. Uh, what do you need to do for that? Take calcium uh, sulfate saturated water or calcium uh, uh, carbonate saturated water or maybe silicate saturated water. I don't know what kind of cement the uh, Coconino sandstone uses, and uh, maybe you knew. Uh, it's uh, both silica and carbonate. Uh, it gets carbonate from the layers above, uh, you know, the chiabs above it, and so on. So it, it's both, uh, and the Coconino sandstone is made of silica. Uh, but uh, with reference to this, uh, this would not form under water. Has this person not heard that you were just referring to of the Bauman sequence of, I mean, we, we form these layers underwater all the time, and one of the the E part, E level of the Bauman sequence is what they call the interturbidite, which is you have fine sediment laid there, uh, which separates it from the next cycle. Well, the, the person who did it, I mean, <clears throat> In that case, we should have no Cambrian trackways, and we obviously do. So something is wrong with the argument. Very, uh, very definitely. But the thing that I see is that, I mean, just <laughs> visually, the dry <clears throat> sand, the, just, it looks to me grossly different from the, from the underwater tracks, and the underwater tracks fit the Coconino, in my opinion, better. Um, the idea of layers on layers with tracks in them is interesting. In St. George, Utah, you've probably seen the dinosaur tracks there. Some spectacular tracks in the mud. Really, really good. And there's, I think if you break those layers apart, you'll find more tracks under them. So how did you put the mud on top of it and then you got some more tracks? But anyway, there's really spectacular tracks over there in St. George, Utah. And that's a good point. <coughs> and, uh, uh, what would be interesting to see is if there are any dinosaurs with a missing toenail or something. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, so where you could say, oh, this is this dinosaur. And then see if the same dinosaur is making tracks, you know, two feet above. Now, uh, you, you think, oh, but that would be so obvious. Well, it's not so obvious. And I'll tell you why it's not so obvious. Um, uh, Michael Ark, who talked about this here briefly, uh, went looking for something that nobody else had ever looked for, and that is the ring patterns of trees that are in the Yellowstone mm -hmm. Fossil Forest. And come to find out there are trees down here with a weather pattern, and there are trees up here with the same weather pattern, and there are trees up further with the same weather pattern, and you're going, this does not make sense on a long-term basis for there to be the perfect weather cycle you know, from one, la one layer to another just before the next layer was uh, buried by ash. Uh, I don't know of any correlation yeah. between volcanic eruptions and weather patterns, uh, or the weather patterns before <coughs> them. So, um, you know, but it's, uh, it's something that if you're thinking short age, you, uh, you might think of looking for. And it was done and it was found, whereas people who had looked at these layers before 
had never even stopped to ask the question whether that was possible. And I think this is one of the things that shows that creation science is perhaps, even if you want to say it's not true, you'd have to say it's at least partially fruitful to think about. <clears throat> yeah. uh, one thing I wish they had added when they were talking about the paraconformities is uh, the fact that there are many of these in the pictures they were showing there that they didn't point out. Uh, and uh, even talking about the uh, Coconino uh, over the Hermit, uh, there's a six million year gap there. But uh, what I wish they had said is contrast this with the topography that you've seen right around us here. And this is a extreme uh, contrast that is almost, you know, just overwhelming in the case that here are all these layers out there, so flat, one on top of the other, spread over hundreds of thousands of square miles, and you have these gaps, and topography is very flat, while the present topography is so up and down. All well, over the the Grand Canyon itself is dug in less than six million years it's, by most everybody's conceding. Uh, so, and you know, it's it's of course the number one <laughs> example of erosion. Because, and uh, we might add to that uh, the amount of erosion you'd expect there is so great. The rate of erosion, the average rate of erosion of our continents is uh, sixty-one millimeters per thousand years. I suppose we could say, what, uh, uh, 60 meters per million years or uh, 200 feet per million years, whatever you want, is the average rate of erosion. Yeah. Well, you start putting time between these layers and you don't have any erosion. Something's radically wrong here. Well, you, you'll notice that the, that the video did mention that in 10 million years yeah. you could erode the entire North American continent out down to, bed, uh, down to water. This, uh, this is, uh, you know, yeah, we've talked about this before here. This is, this is part of the picture. The rate of erosion is just completely out of kilter with what you're seeing out there on the basis of long geological ages. Uh, everything should be gone a long time ago. Yeah. One of the things I like not, about it. And there's not even a little bit of it there. I shouldn't say not even. There is a little bit, folks. There's a little bit of erosion there occasionally. But and they the, mentioned that. As they mentioned, you know, so what? <laughs> you, you, during the flood, you don't expect no erosion. And uh, this, this book, uh, you know, uh, Grand Canyon Monument to Uniform Terrorism, was it Long Ages? Long Ages, I think. To Long right. Ages. They yeah. repeatedly refer to, hey, look at these channels here. Deliver me from channels in a flood, I mean... <laughs> And you're saying against a flood model? You'd expect all kinds of channels to form during a flood. That's just what it does. Yeah. No, I agree. One of the things I like about this video is that it's 22 minutes long. It's not so long as to, you know, have people's eyes glaze over. Oh, 20 minutes? I can't afford that. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, or, you know, an hour... And I've seen videos that go on for two or three hours, uh, and I think that I think that we're better off chopping things into five, ten, uh, twenty-two minutes is probably longer than some people will want to sit. But um, but just uh, I think I think a twenty-two minute film is actually pretty good. You could show you know one of them uh, before. Uh, before some kind of meeting or something, you know. This, I think, is ideal, uh, especially given our society's short attention span. And that's one of the reasons why I, I like it, because it's a quick summary with, uh, like I say, I would add maybe one minute to it, maybe not even that. Um, yeah, here you can see dry sand 
you can see wet sand, you can see damp sand, you can see underwater sand, and you can s there's the pictures. That's it. Uh, the Coconino sandstone has more characteristic of, of the underwater sand. Done. That was what, 10 seconds? Uh, and because I, because I want people to be hit fast with it and hit obviously, and if you if you want to support it more, I would say you know for more information, here are some places to look. And then people who go say, well, is that really fair? Is that really well? You go and look in paleoecology, paleo, whatever it is, you know, and uh, and say, okay, what is the you know? Here are all the photos we have. And then they start scanning the internet and they can see all the photos of the Coconino sandstone and you can see for yourself. Because that really, in the end, that's what the authority of science is. It's not, uh, what I say, what Ariel Rose says, what any of you say, doesn't really count compared with what does it actually look at when you put lizards on it and here are some of the photographs. And as long as you're not cherry picking, um, there's no re there's no uh, final court of appeal from that. I would say one other suggestion. Uh, I wish, and this is uh, debatable. I wish they had been more made more of a point where you've got mixed marine and land deposits together, as uh, this being unusual. Now you could say, well, the dinosaurs were eating seaweed out there in the ocean, uh, but th that's not what we normally expect from land and animals. Well, for that like matter, what were the dinosaurs eating? Uh, uh, but see, I think that'd be better to take that as a separate subject in another video. That's like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or maybe 20. I would rather not, I would yeah. rather not have people burdened by this kind of stuff um, uh, because what will happen is uh, nobody will watch it. A comment in the back here. So of course our... Uh, it's on the internet right now. Now, why they wouldn't have me show it when they've already got it on the internet, I don't know. The only suggestion I can give is that for right now, they want traffic to go to their website so that they can show it and many other w videos. Uh, and maybe that's where it's coming from because if I showed it, why then they'd look at my video and then they'd say, well, uh, okay, I've seen all there is to see and uh, move on. Uh, but yes, if you get the email, you click the link, you can watch the video again. Just a question about this thin layer that they um, <clears throat> described in the, in the video, uh -huh. uh, that it covers many square miles. Uh, my question is, how continuous is it and how broken up? And has there been uplift to some areas, or is it actually still flat, same elevation throughout? Just curious. Well, the truth of the matter is that it has been noticed. It has been noticed in several areas. Nobody has done a systematic drilling through the area to see, well, you know, does it go under, you know, <clears throat> where it's 50 feet or 100 feet or 200 feet or 1,000 feet below the surface, <clears throat> is it still there? So the truth of the matter is the only place that we can really say is wherever it has been eroded to that area. Yeah. Um, and, of course, all the stuff that's off in the air, right. did that originally go over the Grand Canyon? We'll never know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all you can say is it's widespread. Yeah. Uh, now, if somebody were to do some systematic drilling or to go through <coughs> some oil companies drill stuff, because they do keep logs of that kind of thing, one could say, oh, over here it's two inches, over here it's three inches, you know, whatever. And then you could say, well, it actually extends for hundreds of thousands of miles. It's just that uh, nobody's ever sat and done that kind of work. Uh, so the answer is nobody knows. Again, and a, a, some enterprising graduate student mm -hmm. could uh, make him or herself a name 
by showing that this thing was, oh, 50,000 square miles. Uh, I just might add, uh, there is one place in the Shinarp that is claimed in the geologic literature to be an isolated example, and that's in Castle Valley in Utah. Uh, but everywhere else you look, it's always continuous. And uh, no one seems to challenge that at all. But uh, I think he's talking about the layer between the Sinarump and the Moenkopi. Uh, uh, Am I yes, right? That, yes, that yeah. was my original question. But Oh, I, I thought you were talking about the layer itself. No, the, the Sinarump is known to be 100,000 <coughs> square miles more or less. Yeah, they mentioned something I, like that. It was, you know, 85 or 150, nobody's really going to argue with you too much. Because, like I say, some of it's been lost by erosion. If you're talking about the thin layer that he, I think that's that yeah. he's pointing out and so on, that might be more local. Although uh, they have done some work, and it's, this is unbelievable almost. I, I don't know the area. <clears throat> We're talking about the uh, Chenier up here, where they found two layers below. And they found them they're just a few feet below the top. And they found them at least over a quarter of the area, I think, of the Shinarab. Those layers, I mean... I mean, like the Shinarab is split into <coughs> two with a layer in between? or No, the, the, the Shinarab comes down. There's a layer, a special layer, and then there's another layer below it, marker layer, and they follow that for about a quarter of the area of the Shinarab. We're talking about an area, you know... It's like cedar few feet, or ridge or something. Few feet, few feet of one on top of the other, and you had to have this layer laid down all over that area, very flat, and yeah. then above it you had to lay this next layer on top of it. The Shinarb is only like a hundred meters across. <coughs> or oh no, like, or 100 feet. 100 feet. Yes, 30 meters, average. Uh, so it's incredible deposition they have. They didn't say anything about that in the video here, but... Uh, no, that's uh, another video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the thing of it is, some of these people will be actually listening to this kind of thing, and the next time around, they'll do... They'll change it. Maybe they'll even take this one and, you know, cut in a few... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I like the idea of putting just one shot while they're talking of ripples that are underwater. So that, so that you just show it. Yeah. Because they showed two or three underwater shots, but they didn't show the ground. You know, yeah. I mean, no, I agree with you. I think that would be nice. And, and that, that allows people to see with their own eyes rather than just be told. Well, anyway, uh, next week we welcome you to Dr. George Yavor. And, uh, like, did you want to say something at this point? or? Well, <clears throat> I was going to also put into sense about uh, this video. <clears throat> it appeared to me that it was addressed to people who already know the subject somewhat, and they know what the issues are. If you wanted to communicate to people who have no, who have like not say followed high this, geology yes, students. I would have at the end summarized what are the issues that we are addressing and trying to answer, and what are our conclusions in not based on based on what they found. I, I would have appreciated that a, a terse summary. Instead of launching into um, a sermon, you know, which what they've done, you know, they they immediately went to the the throat and they wanted to say we are <coughs> affirming the biblical uh, version of of our Earth's history, which is fine. I have no, of course, we all agree with that. But for a neutral audience, a nice summary would have been appreciated. Spelled out. I would add uh, that I would agree with that uh, idea because I tend to think, of course, 
and I could be wrong, but and I'm sure I'm, I'm in a minority in this, that uh, you don't have to start with a sermon in your argumentation for God and for the Bible. That there's such strong evidence out there for design that you can start from empirical, empirical science and come to the conclusion that there is a God and that the Bible is his communication, at least seems that the most reasonable type of thing. Uh, but every mind works differently. So you're thinking, well, I'm wondering if maybe this kind of thing could be shown to academy students and another version that doesn't start with the Bible in quite the same way uh, be shown to like high well, school. I think for the skeptic, it'd be yeah. nicer if it didn't start I mean, at that level. But I, uh, I realize that the matter of faith is somewhat a subjective thing, although it should not be. Uh, and uh, that uh, some people are affected by one program or another. I'm not being high, very critical mm -hmm. of that, because, but I, I'm more comfortable if you start with the science. Well, for those of you who uh, uh, like to doodle around with uh, uh, video material and put stuff together, now you have uh, some clues as to what can be done. And uh, I think it's an exciting time, but we will see. <laughs>